We have a long, long road ahead to reach 100% renewable energy. Sometimes it feels like it's really slow, like David Hochschild said, we should be there already, why aren't we? <laughs> and sometimes, you know, we're always wondering why isn't this happening faster, but we should stop and smell the roses. And there are success stories that can be reported. Even a small NGO like ours has been internationally active. We've been able and fortunate to have impact around the world and um, bring the message that California has, that yes, indeed, 100% is possible, and yes, indeed, 100% is not science fiction, and we should all feel really good because for the first time, California set a new record on the grid. On February 19th of this year, the California grid was operating at 77% renewable energy, which is tremendous, so we've reached it. <laughs> And that's not counting large hydro, and that's not counting distributed generation as well, which adds another 5 to 10%. So we are pushing 80% and above. It's not science fiction anymore. Like Ken said, we have the technology, we can get there, we need the political will, and we need to be focused because fortunately for all of us, now renewables are the lowest cost alternative. It's not a cost argument anymore. It's an issue of how do we integrate it into the infrastructure, how do we make it happen, and how do we work together as a state, as a nation, and as a global community to make this happen. So because this is a global issue in a global context, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker. Um, Sebastian Kind was, uh, is, is the, I'm going to elevate you, the Minister of Renewable Energy for, for Argentina. He's actually responsible for all of the progressive legislation that has happened in this country that has resulted in auctions for renewable energy at record setting prices. And Argentina didn't have much of a renewable program until 2015. Um, I had the good fortune of being able to visit Argentina as a result of a State Department tour, and that is when I met Sebastian and we started discussing about, well, what are the options, and do you need to go down the fossil path, or is it better to go with renewables, and will renewables be able to provide the results that everybody promises? There's skepticism, there's always been skepticism, but having a state like California, and our experience with being able to integrate renewables into the grid resonates. And this is a story and a success story that should be told over and over again. And Sebastian, of course, is a global person and a dynamic person like all of us. He went um, to the University of, of uh, Argentina to begin, to begin with, with the Technical University, and then he decided he was going to go and do his master's in Brussels, and then he went to Spain. And then, to make it really interesting, like everybody who tries to go to fun places when they study, he decided to study in Greece, <laughs> uh, which is also a good thing. And now he is part of the Eisenhower Fellowship Program that is very interested in making sure that young future politicians are well connected internationally and continue to have the platform to make changes in the areas they're involved in. And that's pushing the 100%, I hope, renewable energy concept in Argentina and Latin America. So thank you so much for coming, Sebastian, all the way from Argentina to join us here. We're very, very interested in hearing your story. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Angelina. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. I'm extremely grateful. Um, this is a, a huge opportunity, and it's always inspiring um, California for us. Um, I just want to tell you and share with you a brief story about my country, and, uh, and then we'd like to, to show a few figures and, and numbers. I took office in the government in uh, 2016, that was like two years ago, never in my life get involved to the public uh, service, I was uh, the last uh, 20 years working in the private sector, always uh, pretty much in renewables, and um, the Congress of Argentina a few years ago um, decided to incorporate a new legislation on renewables and they asked me to, uh, as an advisor, as an external advisor to the Congress to develop the, renewable, the national renewable uh, law. Basically, a new act that said and says something on renewables for incorporating in the country and diversify the mix. Argentina, as you know, is a pretty big country in terms of surface. 
Uh, we do have perhaps one of the most interesting wind and solar res uh, um, resource uh, on Earth today. And uh, nothing was done in the country, so pretty much everything uh, is to be done in terms of renewables and the way we um, we see the electrical mix. So uh, just as a reference, when I took office uh, two years ago, the country was uh, pretty much immersed in a profound energy crisis and economic crisis. Uh, the country had like five different types of X rates compared to dollar with peso. Um, nobody really wanted to to bet a coin in Argentina in a country that is used to change the rules, not even on uh, on a yearly basis, but even on a daily basis. So basically, when uh, one decide to structure 20 years PPA in whatever the country, that means five governments, five administrations, and nobody has to touch anything on terms of the contracts and, and the commitment that, uh, in the contractual relationship uh, is, is signed and, and put in place. So uh, the challenge was in a country that uh, for the international investment community that was absolutely restricted the access to capital how to incorporate uh, capital, direct investment, from private institutions, local and international institutions, for the long term. Again, in a country that nobody believes that even after whatever administration, for years, uh, someone can uh, make a, a long-term commitment for that. So what we had in 2015, so uh, just before I took office in 16, um, is a picture of a country that was subscribing uh, long-term PPAs at values around in solar energy more than $250, $300 megawatt hour. So we, of course, decided to change this, but the point is how to change that. And the interesting thing is that uh, if you put away Europe, the States, Japan, Australia, pretty much the rest of the world, which is two-thirds of the world, are immersed in a, a pretty much the same condition as we have. So we demonstrated that a large deployment of renewables is absolutely feasible even in investment environments as the one we face in Argentina, even with uh, pretty much hostile investment environments. So the point is how to um, capture that investment uh, appetite all over the world and bring them to the country, incorporating capital for long-term view in order to get good tariffs in a system that deserves to have that particularly due to the uh, conditions that we have. Not only about the resources that, of course, yes, we have, but also the demand is there, the need is there. Argentina is importing fuels and is paying $200, $300 a megawatt hour for conventional fuels in the margin of the, of the curve. And uh, capacity factors in wind farms in half of the country, which is the country surface is pretty much 90% of Europe. So it's not as a state, but it's, anyway, it's a very big country. So in half the country, the wind is blowing in capacity factors that results uh, in more than 50%. Uh, the same with solar resource. The resource is coming through the Atacama Desert in Chile, straight in the northwest of Argentina, as one of the most interesting uh, for uh, solar deployment on Earth. So again, and Ken said something before about that the technology is there. So the point is how to deploy that on a large scale. So this was the, the, the difficult situation that we faced at the beginning of 2016, that even everybody but the president and my boss, the minister, uh, um, said that I was absolutely crazy trying to incorporate this plan, the one that I want to show with you, and I want to show the results that are really amazing in just a year. So, um, basically, the country said in 2016 that 50% of the new power generation should come from renewables, which is quite impressive for a country that has done never before in this field almost. 
Uh, that means that the opportunity for the investment community, for the international investment community, is 10,000 megawatts, which represents around between 13 and 15 billion dollars, depends on the mix of, of the technology that we incorporate in the industry. So, uh, I wrote the law for the National Congress for the Senate in 2014. The law uh, finally was passed by and enacted at the end of 2015. So just before I joined the executive branch to incorporate all these measures in the market. And what I said is that we should go no less than 20% of the demand by 2025. But that's a romantic approach. I mean, if you, do, if you don't do anything to achieve that, that's, it's just a saying and that's it. So what I want to show you is what we are doing for achieving that and something that is really working. So basically, demand in Argentina is today is around 140 terawatts hour per year, and it's increasing in around 3% per year, with some efficiency measures that the country is uh, carrying out. We are planning to achieve around 170 terawatts hour in 2000. 25. So pretty much that 20% comparing to X capacity factor for a weight average of whatever percentage per each technology is in the range of 10,000 megawatts of new renewable energy that we should incorporate for tackling this mandate in the law. So basically we started with the, with the law. Uh, the interesting thing to mention in the law is that it, it was subscribed by almost unanimity in the Congress, something that is not common at all, I guess, in in every country, 94%, uh, and this happened exactly uh, four weeks before the presidential elections. So imagine two guys almost killing each other with weapons, you know how it works, and the Congress absolutely stopped and divided, uh, divided. Um, and we have risen a white flag saying, hold on, this must be uh, um, voted in favor for everybody. Well, 94% was pretty much what happened. And the interesting part with this, when we face the investment community, is that this is not a governmental policy. This is not just the policy that will stay in the country for the four years mandate that the president has. This is a federal policy. This is something that is much further than that. When we want to incorporate a 20 years contract in a country that is used to change the rules, every day or almost, it is essential to have something that is crossover political parties. And this is exactly what we had. I took two and a half year of discussions for achieving this number that you see in just in, a, in, a, in, this, uh, in this slide, but uh, uh, it works. After that, I uh, wrote the regulatory decree, which is a, a, a document signed by the president of the country that makes into operation the, uh, the law. And then we designed what we call the program, the Renewable Energy Program. So basically, we split it in two, what we call the so-called Renovar Program, what I want to uh, um, share some details about that. And another scheme, so basically there are two ways for contracting renewables in Argentina according what, to what we uh, wrote in the law. The first is uh, through the um, uh, what we call the joint purchases of the national government. <clears throat> that we, we do it through the ISO, through CAMESA, which is our national ISO. And the other way, uh, the other possibility to con uh, for contracting renewables is through the corporate PPA scheme, which allows large consumers to subscribe PPA with IPPs, with independent uh, producers. So uh, both are working very good, but I want to just put uh, in, in the few minutes that we have uh, an eye on the Renovar program. So. Basically, um, <clears throat> the mandate in the law says that we have to achieve 20% by 2025 with installments in between what we have today and the 8% as a first step um, uh, that, we, that we have to follow. So basically 8%, 12%, 14 and so on. So we think that we're going to achieve the 20% much before the 2025 due to the success of the program. And we see that the 12% will be even uh, above that, around 14% by uh, the end of next year. Oh, one minute, I need a little bit more. <laughs> okay, if I, if I can. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay. I'm trying to do my best, even in English, you know. <laughs> You're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> okay, so this is the most interesting part of the presentation, <laughs> just for, for my friend. <laughs> Uh, so basically, we split the story uh, of Renovar in, in two things. The first, a bankable set of contracts. And when I say bankable set of contracts, means that we and myself brought a lot of inst financial institutions from all over the world to join my table in my office from the beginning. And uh, what I said to them is that uh, we are not writing, we are, we, we, we didn't want to write anything tailor-made for them, but we just want to be sure that whatever we uh, write is going to work in the market at the end of the story because we need that private investment to come. But uh, So basically, we split the contracts in two, number one in blue and, and number two. Both together is pretty much what you know as a regular PPA. The point is that we decided to split it in two different contracts just because of the fact that we decided to incorporate the, uh, what we call the, the warranty stream. And this is perhaps the heart and the core of Renovar program. So basically, we incorporated a set of warranties that uh, at the end of the story, what is doing and producing is uh, an effect that um, we, we shielded the, the Renovar program out of the Argentinian risk, out of the political risk, and we put it in the capital market, in the international capital market. So no matter the assets are being structured in Argentina, whatever investor, international investor, might be very um, uh, tranquil with the fact that long term is absolutely feasible even in a hostile investment environment as we face in Argentina. So basically, what is this about? We design a, a trust fund that is called uh, Foder. Unfortunately, Foder in Portuguese means something that I don't want to repeat, but I realized this uh, after I created, so still the name is there. Uh, and we speak Spanish, not Portuguese, so it's fine in Argentina anyway. So the first uh, is an energy payment account, a sort of scroll account in which we decided to incorporate capital in advance just to cover um, uh, the off-taker risk. Basically, the off-taker, if the off-taker if the off -taker has any problem to pay whatever commitment has in the contracts, there is a scroll account that is triggered automatically without any need for any official in the government. Myself will be five minutes in the government, but this must be 20 years in place. So this has something, uh, this has money incorporated from the treasury. Does it not touch anyway? The money is there. We bought bonds and so on, but it's there. This is what I call the worst case scenario chain. What happens if the money is, uh, I mean, what we have incorporated there is just 5% of the contract, which is 12 months of PPA, right? In a 20 years PPA, 95% still remains. So. If the off-taker has a problem to pay, which is the risk that everybody see in whatever the market, uh, then the energy payment account is triggered. And if this is out of money, then you have a put option with treasury notes in advance that we gave for 100% of, of the capex, non-amortized capex, non-amortized value of your capex. So basically, the put option is uh, an option that you have, and it's an obligation that the government has to pay you uh, in case you decide to trigger that put option. So we escape from the off-taker risk into the sovereign risk. So that's pretty much an interesting part of the story. We escape from the off-taker risk into a sovereign risk. And uh, we gave comfort to the investors that whatever happened with the off-taker, Argentina government and the state of Argentina is behind. But what if, worst case scenario chain, the country gets into a default? So you have your treasury notes, you go to the national bank, and nobody will pay you. Basically, that's not going to happen. We are absolutely sure that this is something that uh, is impossible to, um, as a situation to have. But you know, that's the risk. Everywhere on earth, this is the risk. Uh, have a look to what is going on even in Spain with some things, or even in Brazil, or even in other markets. So we decided to broad as a third step a AAA warranty to support the program, which is a warranty coming from the World Bank that is optional for the projects. The projects decide to get into that or not. We are not obliging them to uh, accept the third step. But the World Bank has two uh, particular 
an interesting effects. The first is that uh, the instrument, the financial instrument itself, which is a warranty, a AAA warranty in the back in a country that is not AAA rating, of course. And the second is the sale of the World Bank. Basically, an international institution that is saying, yes, the due diligence was done and everything is perfect, the documents are fantastic, please come. So I don't want to spend some time uh, explaining this because I, I just want to show you the last figures. Uh, of course, I will be delighted to share with you all the details about how the system and the mechanism works. Uh, but it's pretty much as I said, so we have the liquidity warranty, which is the first account. And then what we have is a termination payment warranty uh, instrumented by the Treasury bills and the World Bank warranty that is supporting uh, as a third level the, um, the program. So basically, some results. We, um, we issued Renovar round one, 1,000 megawatts we offer, and we received more than six times over subscription. We issued round two, and we received more than eight times over subscription. So that's really something impressive in terms of the <laughs> In terms of the amount of projects uh, from all over the world and, and sponsors and companies that decided to participate in a country that few months before, this was implemented in just five months, was impossible to think that Argentina was able to structure long term. So basically, um, well, all around the country, so a mandate that I myself even wrote in the law is that uh, this should be a federal policy, which means that mm, along the country uh, we should incorporate renewables. Uh, so, so far what we have is 147 water projects split it in different technologies in 95% of the territory, around 4.5 gigawatts of new capacities awarded, and uh, all of them should be in place in less than 30 months. But perhaps the most interesting is what is going on today. So in less than a year, today we have 100% of the contracts of run one and 1.5 absolutely signed with all the warranties from the sponsors absolutely committed, 51% under construction, that is 1,600 megawatts under construction in $2.5 billion of new capital that is coming to Argentina today. Today we have in our roads is full of uh, towers, blades, nacelles, uh, solar panels, $2.5 billion, 2,500 um, thousand million dollars are uh, happening today. About the prices, we come from around $300 megawatt hour immediately into $37, $40 megawatt hour range in less than a year. So we diminish by 10, a factor by 10, the solar energy in the country and around a factor by five, the wind energy prices. This is not rocket science. We just needed to incorporate a, an instrument that can structure long term and, and is absolutely feasible even in hostile investment environments as you know Argentina uh, was immersed. The good side of this and the good idea and the good part of this is that this is uh, inspirational for everybody in the world. Today even Colombia or Indonesia or other markets are trying to replicate Renovar. What I think it deserves, and is part of what I'm trying to understand from, uh, from you and, and uh, traveling all around the states uh, along these two months, uh, this deserves to be replicated in, on a global platform. For everybody that want to incorporate and want to jump from $200 range into a tenth of that. No matter where we are, no matter the country, that uh, is uh, we are speaking about. Of course, this might not be replicated everywhere, but you know, in half of the world, it might be replicated, and it's very expensive to be poor. This is the the, the conclusion of this. I mean, the less res economic resources you have, the more you are paying your energy, and the more natural resources you have. So it's just a matter. It's not a technology is there. It's a matter of how to understand a uh, possibility for structuring long term, no matter where you are. 
Well, uh, just to finish, a global scale model. So basically what we have is a state policy, what we call federal policy actually, uh, a transparency in the process. So with a previous public consultation and complete information access to stakeholders, uh, something that we can diversify technological and geographically, a solid warranty mechanism, what we call uh, the, the, the mechanism structure in the Fodder Trust Fund. So this is the, the risk in structure, the key for the structure of the long-term view. And um, well, that's pretty much what we have. Thank you very much. Yeah.